Hey, what's going on, everybody? Two London Read Filmmaker here, where the answers comes first, the reasons come last, but we're constantly and always still learning. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Great Joy Anamorphic 50 millimeter lens for full frame with a 1.8 squeeze. Now, Great Joy didn't send this out to me. I actually purchased this lens with my own money through the Indiegogo campaign. So regardless if they sent this out to me, all my opinions are my own. So without further ado, the TLDR here is that if you want a mirrorless mount version, it's gonna cost you about $1,400. If you want an EF or PL mount version, it's gonna cost you $1,700. Now the build quality is primarily made out of metal, but it's not so heavy that you can't balance it on a gimbal. When it comes to the focus throw, it's approximately 270 degrees, which is great for cinema applications. However, if you are gonna be going handheld and you're gonna be pulling focus with your hand, that might be a little bit difficult depending on what kind of shooting situation you're in. In which case, you'll probably want something like a wireless follow focusing system. I'm using the PD Movie Live Air 2S, which I have done a review, which you can see right up here. One thing to note about the PL and EF mount is that the rear element does actually stick out, which basically means if you're going to try to use a speed booster, well, that's pretty much not going to work. If you're going to try to put it on your old Canon 5D Mark II, the mirror is probably going to get in the way. Um, you might need to turn on the camera first to get that mirror to flip. And in terms of cinema cameras, some cinema cameras, that little square opening might be too small. So here is the current list that we know of in terms of what cinema cameras will work, and especially the ones with built-in NDs. Now the squeeze factor is unfortunately not consistent. If you are focusing to infinity, you'll get your 1.8 squeeze. If you're focusing close up, approximately three feet away, you're gonna get about 1.62. Now there is a very easy fix for this. With a cheap diopter set, you can use a plus one and a plus two diopter to get that full 1.8 squeeze at the extreme close up. When we look at the focus breathing, it's pretty much non-existent, which is awesome, as traditional anamorphic lenses do have a lot of focus breathing. When we come to distortion, we do see very little with this lens, but we do see just enough of it to get that anamorphic feel. And of course, let's talk about the flaring. The streaks are actually on the thin side, not terribly thick. And when it comes to how easy does this lens flare, it's actually a little bit hard to get it to flare. You have to be very, very direct with it. And depending on your type of look, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. And hey, that is the end of the TLDR section. If that's all you needed, cool, I will see you guys in the next one. Otherwise, stick around and hear my thoughts on why I think this is the best budget anamorphic lens currently on the market. So you might be asking yourself now, all right, so what do I actually gain with an anamorphic lens visually and just in general? What do I get with my anamorphic investment? So what you're gonna get, number one, is resolution. Because if you're shooting a fake cinemascope look with a spherical lens and you're just adding the crop bars on the top and bottom, you're basically taking your 4K image and cutting away resolution from the top and bottom. And that's it, that's all you have to work with. Whereas with an anamorphic lens, what you're doing is you're taking this really, really wide field of view as well as the vertical, and you're using the entire sensor with that squeezed image. When you de-squeeze it out, you're actually pulling more resolution on the horizontal end, and therefore you have a lot more to work with if you are compressing it down to a 4K image or even uh, smaller to like a 1080, you're gonna have a lot more resolution to work with when it comes to using this wide cinema scope. Now, the major, major non-discounted thing about an anamorphic lens is the fact that the bokeh has a completely different characteristics than a spherical lens as you see here. The anamorphic is gonna have a vertical stretch, whereas a spherical lens is just gonna look creamy and blurry, and that's it. With this vertical stretch, in my opinion, it actually makes your subject stand out just a little bit more, and it also looks more organic to me. I've been told and have heard people talk about the anamorphic bokeh being kind of like a painting, and it's basically true. Some painters, what they would do is they'll paint everything, and to blur the background, they'll just smear the paint up and down, and that is a certain technique that we see here with an anamorphic lens, and therefore, in my opinion, looks much more organic. Now, of course, we can talk about the flaring. The flares, that horizontal streak, we pretty much associate it with sci-fi films and action films because that's what we've seen from the earlier films up until now. But one other way to describe this is that horizontal flares 
don't really show up in real life. So because we now see this as an artifact of an anamorphic lens, it basically takes your story and heightens the reality of it because that's not something we usually see. Now a benefit with shooting with anamorphic glass on a 16 by 9 sensor is of course you have this crazy aspect ratio that I don't think a lot of us are necessarily going to publish in. So if we are actually going to zoom in and get to a classic cinema scope, because of all that resolution I talked about earlier, you now have the ability to actually reframe your shot. And if you go to a 16 by 9, you have even more ability to reframe your shot. This is definitely a plus and gives you more options than if you were to shoot with a spherical lens, only giving you reframing options from the top and the bottom. All right, let's talk about the squeeze factor and how it's not constant in this quick example. So I'm approximately, I wanna say about four feet away from the camera sensor, and this is what the bokeh looks like. Now, if I put a plus one in diopter, this is what happens. And now that I have a plus one diopter focused to infinity, so I get the full 1.8 squeeze, as you can tell by the bokeh balls in the back, the bokeh is much more stretched. And this diopter set is only about 30 bucks and you get four of them. You get a plus one, plus two, plus five, and a plus 10. In my opinion, the plus one and the plus two are the most useful. A plus one, as you just saw, gives you a close up, and a plus two will get you a little bit more of an extreme close up. Now you might be saying, Okay, well, what if I want to do a medium shot and I want to still get that 1.8 squeeze somehow? In which case, you're going to need a different type of diopter that is a plus 0.5. And I'll leave a link down below. This is probably the cheapest one that I've seen, and it's actually a set of a 0.5 and a plus 1, which is actually great. But I don't actually think you truly need it because when you're framing for like a waist to head shot, a medium shot, your squeeze factor is approximately, I want to say 1.7-ish, and a 1.7 to a 1.8 is actually not that big of a difference, and the bokeh is not going to change all that much, in my opinion. So I would say you only really just need the plus 1 and the plus 2, and you should be good to go when it comes to the squeeze factor. One of the major selling points for the Great Joy is the fact that they have a PL and EF mount version. Saray is the closest in terms of budget, but they don't have these lens mount options. And this is a major con for me for them. Because with Great Joy, with an EF and PL mount, it ensures you that no matter what camera system you go to in the future, you're going to be able to take your lenses and mount it on those mirrorless cameras. Because an E mount, an L mount, a Z mount, an adapter is not going to actually allow you to switch between the two. Whereas if you have an EF and PL mount, you can. So basically what I'm saying is, is that you might be a diehard Sony fan at this point in time, but Canon or Panasonic could eventually make your dream camera, forcing you to want to switch systems. And in which case, you want to make sure your lenses can go with you so you don't have to sell these lenses and then rebuy the exact same one in a different mount option. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is, if you take a look at the budget, the fact that there's an EF and PL mount version, it's a full frame lens with a 1.8 squeeze. This is probably the best value for your money when it comes to an anamorphic lens. Now, I know some of you guys might be saying, well, but the 1.8 squeeze not being consistent, that's a problem. And I counter that it's probably not as big of a problem as you think. Because if you look at your project, chances are, like 50% of your shots, if not 90% of your shots, are not really gonna have too much rack focusing, especially when it comes to rack focusing from infinity to close up. So when you take a look at your project shots, if you are gonna be doing a close up shot, you just pop on a diopter and you're good to go. If you're doing a medium shot, a 1.7 to a 1.8 squeeze is actually not that big of a deal. So obviously I would wish it would be consistent, but for the most part, a little $30 diopter kit is going to keep you with the 1.8 squeeze throughout pretty much all of your project. Now, there are two other focal lengths that are coming. There's a 35 millimeter coming at the end of September, I believe, and that one will have consistent uh, squeeze factor, which is awesome. Then they have an 85, which I hope is gonna have a consistent squeeze because that lens is definitely gonna give you a lot more smear and a lot more heavy <laughs> anamorphic bokeh effect. So those are very exciting. I can't wait to test those out. Last but not least, the flare characteristics not being super, super heavy and the fact that the lens is hard to flare. I don't see this as a con. I see this as an extreme pro. 
Because if you take a look at commercial work or even romantic comedy movies, obviously those flare streaks never show up because there's no need for them to show up in the film. So this lens being like so much harder for it to flare, and if it does flare, it doesn't flare a lot, tells me that I can use it on commercial shoots and I can use it on romantic comedies and other projects so that I don't get this crazy blue flare coming out of nowhere. So those are my thoughts and I hope this video has been helpful. If this video has been helpful, I do have some purchase links down below. They are affiliated, so if you use them, it does help support the channel, and I thank you for that. Otherwise, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave it down below. I will get to them as fast as I can. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and share the crap out of this video, because I would love to work with Great Joy so I can review their 35mm and 85mm for you guys. So, without further ado, see you guys in the next one.